Welcome to Computerized Physician Order Entry in Rural and Critical Access Hospitals. During this session, participants will learn best practices when implementing new CPOE processes. Participants will learn strategies to address rural envi environmental factors for critical access in rural hospitals. And participants will learn about strategies for proper automation of prescription workflows. I'd like to now give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Tammy Flick. I am a registered nurse by background. I am the lead health IT advisor for Telogen, which is the regional extension center for Iowa. I have worked in the hospital setting for 17 years, including working for a critical access hospital as the director of informatics. My clinical background includes the emergency department and the intensive care departments. Hi, I'm Paul Moore, and I have the privilege of serving as the Senior Health Policy Advisor for your Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Probably more important to this audience today is that I am a former critical access hospital administrator. I've been where many of you are, and I look forward to sharing with you today. Hi, I'm Scott Pettigrew. I am a medical practice consultant at HealthBridge and the Tri-State Regional Extension Center located in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have 15 years of medical IT experience, and more specifically, 15 years in experience in helping uh, clinicians and utilize uh, CPOE in their practices. I started out with PocketScript, which was one of the nascent e-prescribers, coming out uh, in, in the late uh, 19, uh, late 1990s and in, in the early 2000s, and did implementations all over Massachusetts, Texas, California. Um, uh, and basically all over the United States. Currently working, as I said, as a medical practice consultant in the Regional Extension Center here in Cincinnati, helping practices achieve meaningful use with, and I specifically focus on IT issues. And this is Mary Zile. I'm a registered nurse as well with a Master's in Health Services Administration. I have extensive experience in cardiac surgical intensive care, various hospital settings, occupational health urgent care, uh, primary care offices, and I implemented an EHR in 2001. And I had extensive experience in the regional quality improvements that we've had in the Cincinnati region, including patient center medicom, medical home, our public reporting pilots, health measures and bridges to excellence, and the primary care innovation group through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I implemented an EHR in 2001 in our rural critical access hospital located over an hour from Cincinnati. Okay, thank you. And Mary Ziles and Scott Pettigrew will present first. Okay, we are presenting on the critical CPOE barriers and best practices for rural and critical access hospitals, specifically from the physician and provider viewpoint. I will be addressing barriers, and then Scott will follow up with best practices. When you ask, when you talk about CPOE, I'm clinical, so when you talk about CPOE, you have to understand what has been the problems in the past with the paper-based medication prescriptions. The Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science has had done extensive studies to show that 7,000 Americans die annually due to preventable medication errors, 1.5 million are injured, 1.5 to 4 percent of prescriptions are in, areas, are in error, which result in serious health effects, and 5 to 18 percent of ambulatory patients experience adverse drug effects. This costs in excess of $2 billion per year. This is because of patient safety errors, which include illegible handwriting, incomplete order, inappropriate medication selection, dosing, or frequency of medication administration, or the inability to check electronic interactions, such as drug-to-drug, drug-to-allergy, drug-to-disease, and drug-to-lab interactions. And I have specific examples of patients who were on Coumadin from us and Dicumarol from the specialist or Lasix from us and Ferrosamide from the specialist or an actual patient death resulted from a penicillin allergy because the specialist um, did not have interactions with the electronic CPOE. So it's very important to me uh, to be a part of this process to help educate um, people, especially with the limitations in the critical access hospital communities. Another uh, problem for um, paper-based medications is there's a reduction in provider and prescription uh, prescriber 
prescriber and pharmacy efficiency. Pharmacies get over 150 million calls per year. These calls go to physician practices, and Medical Group Management Association says that there's 19, over $19,000 associated with the practice in receiving these pharmacy calls, and that's for manually processing refills, resolving issues related to formulary, and resolving issues related to dosage and um, legibility. There's also unnecessary variations in care, unnecessary adhering to medication and treatment guidelines, and difficulty adhering to a formulary when you're on a paper system. More than 3.52 billion prescriptions are written annually in the United States with an expected growth of over 4.3 per year. And so you can see in a paper system, this becomes untenable, undoable, and an unsafe environment for patients. So why use computerized CPOE? In addition to the statistics that I've already quoted, the Institute of Medicine reports through the Harvard Medical Practice Study and the Colorado and Utah Hospital Study, in addition to the New York studies, indicate that 44 to 98,000 Americans die each year as a result of medicine errors. This makes this the eighth leading cause of death, and more people die from these medical errors in a given year than from motor vehicle accidents, breast cancer, and AIDS. So going to the CPOE definition, it's a system for direct entry of one or more types of medical orders by physician into a system that transmits those orders electronically to the appropriate department. It, it includes alerts, drug information, access to evidence-based clinical guidelines, and some degree of decision support functionality. It includes physicians, but it also includes other practitioners like nurse practitioners who are able to write prescriptions. And so when you discuss CPOE, you need to include all practitioners in that category. As a summary of stage one and stage two for eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals regarding CPOE, the stage one objective says to use a CPOE for medication orders entered by licensed healthcare professionals and the measure states for more than 30% of unique patients with at least one medication in their medication list admitted to the eligible hospital or critical access inpatient or emergency department. The differences in stage two shows that the medication CPOE goes up from 30% to 60%, and then it also adds laboratory CPOE for a 30% threshold and radiology CPOE for a 30% threshold. Now you have a CPOE conundrum. If processing a prescription drug order through a CPOE decreases the likelihood of error on that order by 48%, why is everyone still on paper and why isn't everyone using CPOE? There was a study done from AMI, AMIA, American Medical Informatics Association, co-authored by David Blumenthal, that talked about the major barriers to CPOE implementation in hospitals, specifically critical access hospitals. The two major barriers for CPOE CPOE implementation are cost, and the major strategy for overcoming this barrier is by prioritizing patient safety at the top of the agenda. The second major barrier is physician resistance, and the major strategy for uh, dealing with that is to leverage strong leadership, external influence, vendor commitment, and the presence of house staff and hospitalists. So, so now Scott and I will be addressing the barriers and best practices. Despite the CPOE system's effectiveness at preventing medication errors, adoption and use in the United States still remains modest. As of 2003, only 5 to 10 percent of U.S. hospitals had implemented these systems. Again, going back to the American Medical Informatics Association, uh, major barriers are cost as high as 10 to 30 million for a large hospital, lower 3 to 10 million for smaller hospitals, uncertain return on investments, there's a potential negative workflow on physicians, negative impact on physician workflow, flow, uh, concern about physician rebe rebellion, especially in smaller hospitals that don't have um, as much staffing or that does, don't have hospitalists. And then there's difficulty training physicians, particularly at community hospitals. So according to findings through the overcoming challenges uh, to achieving meaningful use through the CMS, CMMS, the findings showed that hospitals that had difficulty meeting CPOE requirements were 18% less likely to receive incentive payments than hospitals that cited difficulties with other criteria. Said in a different way, if the hospital had CPOE barriers, they were less likely to achieve meaningful use. The other barriers, aside from CPOE, were easier to circumvent. 
So CPOE was the biggest barrier for meaningful use attestation. As far as lags in rural and critical access hospitals, <clears throat> specifically there's workforce shortages in critical access hospital and rural areas. Through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, it shows there are shortages, shortages of these providers in rural communities, even as the demand for health care services increase. Many of these rural communities continue to struggle to recruit and retain an adequate number of primary health care professionals. These rural communities generally have fewer, hospital, fewer physicians, nurses, specialists, IT resources, and other health care workforce. And the smaller population size and scale makes a loss or shortage of a single practitioner um, a greater impact in these small rural communities. So in, in summary of this, the population in rural America constitutes 20% of the total population, while only 11% of the physicians practice in these areas. Regarding the expense of CPOE in the rural areas, especially because of the enha enhanced functionality and the cost, there's a dramatic increase in the operating cost for rural and critical access hospitals. Um, and this is in the absence of substantial cost savings associated with improved efficiency or improved patient safety. For critical access hospitals, there's estimated implementation costs of 19% of their current operating costs to as high as 30%. So this is a significant financial barrier for these critical access hospitals. In addition to barriers for critical access hospitals, there's limitations and lags in, in the Internet. The FCC found that the rural Internet access is still lagging. Out of the 19 million Americans that have no access to high-speed Internet, three-quarters of these live in rural areas. And in this FCC report, they showed that Internet providers that do not – Internet providers do not offer these services in rural areas because there's no business case to offer broadband. Okay, so as far as other area, uh, other COP lags in rural and critical access hospitals, um, the rural emergency departments were much less likely than those in the urban hospitals as to have the CPOE systems. 6% in rural EDs, 20% in EDs in rural areas close to cities, where in the urban areas, CPOE was at 40%. So it was anywhere from five to two to five times higher chance of using CPOE in a hospital in an urban area. In addition to the rural facilities, they have difficulty training IT staff, they don't, and they have limitations in staff IT coverage. It's harder for them to, have to find the staff um, compared to a sizable IT department in a rural area. And it's for a small critical access hospital, it's, it's hard for them to even have one to two technicians, and they have an inability to co cover 24-7. Another major barrier for ED uh, CPOE in the rural community is the complexity compared to other ED software. EDs have a passive functionality which require little or no change in workflow, and in contrast, computerized tasks such as data collection and CPOE alter the workflow extensively and they require additional effort from staff and the clinicians. As a result, physicians buy-in is even more critical in the higher stages of health IT adoption, and these workforce necessary for this are just not available in the rural communities. Um, as far as from the physician standpoint, there's a higher proportion of near retirement primary care physicians in the rural community, and so there's less um, younger physicians which have more technology experience. And so this helps also helps to inhibit the CPOE um, implementations in rural communities. This also gives more pressure to the existing physician rural workforce who work longer hours see a greater number of patients, they have a greater number and greater variety of procedures, and um, they have to exhibit a broader range of competencies. So they're maxed out as far as their work time already. So within a critical access hospital, you need a physician champion, and this is difficult because the physicians are already working um, many hours. So as far as the CPOE barrier categories, and we won't cover each of these in detail because we'll have a follow-up um, hour presentation that will cover these barriers and best practices in more detail. But the major categories that we haven't already discussed include additional barriers on vendor, hardware, software, administration, staff and provider, workflow, patient safety, and patient perception. 
Um, and to summarize this section, 66% of critical access hospitals have electronic viewing and laboratory test results, and this is compared to 91% of non-critical access hospitals. 22% of critical access hospitals use electronic clinical reminders compared to 44% of non-critical access hospitals. So the critical access hospitals are one-half to two-thirds of functionality. Um, so then just to give you a couple uh, brief points as far as other barriers that we'll discuss further with our next webinar, uh, vendor barriers may include inadequate or misappropriated training for CPOE or poorly designed CPOE workflow. We also have software barriers that we will discuss which include internet access limitations or the expense and access to wireless networking um, and the reduction of broadband in the, in the rural areas. Uh, software barriers will be discussed further, um, and this has to do with the managers who are unable to purchase a fully functioning CPOE from their primary vendors, or they may have to sacrifice between buying the CPOE from their primary vendors or building an IT infrastructure around new CPOE vendors. And then uh, to summarize then, the administrative barriers beyond cost and physician rebellion, uh, there's also an uncertain return on investment uh, negative potential impact on physician workflow on an already taxed physician staff, and then difficulty training um, physicians, especially in the, these community hospitals. And because of this, administrative barriers include reluctance and policy priority, reduced administrative support, and no clear pl plan or process. And so um, with that, I will turn it over with, to Scott Pettigrew, who will discuss some of the best practices to circumvent these barriers. Thanks, Mary. Um, we're going to talk about best practices categories uh, for rural and, and critical access hospitals. And the major, major areas we're going to focus on are training, workflow, system configuration, goal attainment, and change management. With regards to training, I'm only going to hit a couple of these, uh, of these bullet point items. Again, we're going to have a kind of a deeper dive scenario later, and we'll cover each of these in more detail there. Um, the first one I wanted to cover here was project management strategy. It is extremely important along these, these projects, along these implementation projects and also the training, to have a very clear communication uh, style of project management. Sometimes project management tends to falter in communications, and this can really hinder uptake and, and uh, acceptance of CPOE within the clinical environment. Secondly, the, uh, CP, you need to provide the physicians and, and all of the providers a summary of benefits, including the order sets, decision supports, and alerts. You really have to outline to these providers why we are changing the paradigm under which they do their jobs. Um, stressing the tools that will provide them with ease of use in, in their everyday job. You have to really sell this product. You have to sell the, you have to sell the benefits. Can, um, Lastly, on this, on this slide, I wanted to cover the conversion of order sets, standing orders, and best practices from paper to electronic. We are not changing the job that these providers are doing on a daily basis, but we are changing uh, a little bit of the paradigm under which they perform their job, and we're definitely changing the tools that they're using to perform their job. And so it's, it's important to stress the similarities that we're really not changing too much we're just changing how it's documented. We're also providing a safer environment for them to actually perform the best medicine that they can. Continuing on training, um, this, the first bullet point, the CPOE super user staff shadowing across all locations and all shifts. Very important, especially on Go Live, to have a, a, almost a hand-holding type atmosphere. Um, I worked at Cincinnati Children's Hospital as we went live on an electronic medical record system. And we utilize this, uh, the super user staff shadowing across all locations and all shifts very well. And as a matter of fact, uh, Sensei Children's took the extra step of going live with very visible bright red t-shirts for all of their super users so that any user who was in trouble knew exactly whom they could seek out in order to find help. And this really raised the comfort level of everyone involved and really helped our go live process uh, be much more smooth than it would otherwise have been. 
Um, along the same line, cross-training of, of adequately educated staff for building and keeping order sets up to date. You're going to hear me talk a lot about quality improvement processes, particularly PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, and act, which is a quality improvement uh, type of methodology. And this is the type of, of, uh, of item that, that really supports that quality improvement mentality. Um, may require some reports to find out what what uh, uh, what prescriptions and what orders are being are being called most common, in order to put order sets and to to really tailor order sets to the roles and to the particular providers, so they can be used very very efficiently. And this also may change based on seasonality. For example, during flu season, you may have a very different order set that you want to have highlighted at the top of your list than you would during the rest of the year. Um, the accessibility of webinar and written training um, materials is very, very important. Uh, we all have times where we walk away from something for a little while and come back and try to remember where we were and step into it. And this actually gets exacerbated for doctors who may go on vacation and come back and, and, and just need a little brush up on, on what needs to be done in order to um, maintain their documentation and, and maintain their, their CPOE. Reviewing physician issues, problems, and gaps in CPOE compliance to determine gaps in knowledge. It, we, again, this goes back to that quality improvement mentality. We really need to uh, follow through with these physicians to say what works, what doesn't, and find out why. And that follow through is critical to maintain the trusted advisor role, which is really going to maintain credibility for the project. Moving now into workflow issues, workflow best practices. Uh, one of the most important things that you can do <coughs> is to define your leadership. And you have a, a critical decision to make, internal leadership versus an external facilitator for workflow lead. Possibly a combination of the two. And here's, here's why this is important. Internal leadership, of course, provides you with that link between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. You have an established leadership chain. However, an external facilitator can be absolutely critical to bringing fresh eyes and also providing suggestions that may actually uh, transcend the political boundaries that exist within your organization. It's oftentimes easier for someone outside the organization to point out flaws in methodologies, flaws in training, and to, and to really um, allow those suggestions and, and requirements to be met much more readily by staff. Also, we want to look at an, uh, analyzing the organization steps necessary to support the CPOE workflow change. This really comes down to gap analysis. We need to say where are we at when we start this process or, or at any particular time, and where do we need to go to facilitate our goals? Stepping down the list towards the bottom, evaluating barriers related to individual versus system issues. We need to consider the ability of our users prior to training and prior and, and actually during the go live process. Um, oftentimes when users say the system doesn't work, they'll throw up their hands and really what's happening here is that the system, uh, the, the user may have reached saturation during training and may just need a little more in, in the uh, training realm in order to overcome these workflow issues. It may also point to, rather than a systemic view, uh, a systemic problem, it may point to a more, um, more of an individual misunderstanding of how to actually perform the workflows involved. Uh, best practices for system configuration. Uh, one of the most important that I can think of is making the standard or canned order sets available. Now, I'm going to kind of combine this one with the next bullet point item, which, which is that these have to be role-based and specialty-based so that we can take a look at, uh, it doesn't do a lot of good for a, for a OB-GYN provider to have a general practitioner's order set and, and vice versa. So we really need to make sure that the order sets are tailored to each individual user. And these seem like common sense items, but oftentimes they are overlooked in the configuration process. Um, a focus on security and data integrity. One large crash, one big downtime, especially at a critical point like go live or in a, in a bad situation, can actually ruin 
all of your hard work and make subsequent implementation efforts that much harder because your credibility has been tanked. So focusing on security and data integrity, and one more thing that I'd like to drop in there is also training users on what to do when things go wrong um, so that if the computer system does go down, there is not this panic of what do we do. It's a knowledge of, okay, our downtime forms are here, and here are the processes that we do in order to keep going. This training should happen at the very least on a uh, twice yearly basis, and actually I would actually push more towards a quarterly basis. With regards to CPOE goal attainment, I would uh, love to say celebrate, celebrate your successes. But you also need a, a physician champion for an empowerment, involvement, and leadership. That internal rock, that bedrock of your system that people will turn to both for um, support when, when things are going right, but also to help when things are going wrong, to, to, keep, to get them through some of the harder times. Um, Backing up that physician, physician champion should be a physician advisory group with team representation. So you have all of the stakeholders from the entire, from the entire organization that are helping to give their input with regards to uh, the utilization of the CPOE. Now, again, order sets, uh, the role, the location, and the per-provider per order sets you can actually come to a large amount of consensus with this physician advisory group. So it's great, it's a great tool to utilize, and it really does smooth things over. All right, and finally, uh, the best practices for change management. Um, you really need to communicate your change management processes. One of the things we do uh, at the Regional Extension Center here in Cincinnati is that we actually go and involve everybody in the kickoff process, not just a, a leadership team. We actually have a kickoff meeting with everybody. We get barriers out of the way as far as personal and, and uh, opinion barriers out of the way by involving these, by involving everybody in the organization in a come together. What do you what do you know about CPOE? What do you know about these systems, what are you afraid of? And let's address these issues right off the bat. We also want to um, engage patients and staff in patient safety. So we want to have a, an understanding that everybody here is involved in the patient safety and involved um, in, in the best, providing the best medicine that they possibly can. Well, with regards to, to our um, part of this presentation uh, and best practices, we'll be going into a lot more detail during the, the deeper dive that we're going to do. I'll turn it back over to Mary. Thank you, Scott. And Tammy Flick will now um, go forward with her portion of the presentation. Perfect. To Tammy. Thanks, Scott and Mary. Thank you very much. Again, this is Tammy Flick, and I do work for Telogen, which is the regional extension center here in Iowa, and I have worked in critical access hospitals. So I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into a nursing perspective on CPOE. Um, so we'll go ahead and move forward here. A little bit of a background related to nurses and CPOE, and I, I wanted to reiterate that with CPOE, it isn't just physicians, it is providers who enter these orders. So most of the time, nurses and ancillary staff assist those providers with CPOE usage and training. Um, these nurses have to perform multiple roles, especially in critical access in rural hospitals, and so the onus of having to uh, educate these providers can be difficult at times as to finding them in the right place at the right time to provide that education and training. Nursing staff is also able to enter orders via CPOE, whether those be verbal orders or phone orders, and they are often looked to as the teachers for all the providers in their organization. Um, I know personally that um, there's a huge change in workflows related to going from paper to electronic, and sometimes this can really be difficult. Um, I think everybody, being a human, we're creatures of habit, and so changing that workflow and changing that process can be very difficult for people who have been doing it for many, many, many years. Um, I did have a provider one time tell me that he was going to retire and hunt and live off the land with his dogs rather than use an electronic medical record. So 
sometimes that's a barrier that you run up against when you're working in these smaller settings. I did review a study from HIMSS, and I wanted to touch base with you on this because I, although this is a larger facility, there's a lot of takeaways that were found in this study that I really think are applicable to even the rural and critical access hospital setting. Um, this uh, survey was done on a CPOA implementation that happened in 2008, and they did the survey about four to ten months post-implementation and there were 28 nurses and five physicians that responded. What we did find from this survey is that they recommended several things, setting some realistic expectations, um, trying to be at 100% CPOE usage uh, immediately after implementation is not necessarily the best practice. We want to make sure that everyone is on board and using it effectively and appropriately and safely. Um, training time does tend to take a lot longer than what is anticipated, so making sure to have that in the back of your mind as you implement. Um, it's really important for those providers and nurses to regularly round and have those discussions that happen in the hallways so that they can keep up to date on what's happening with their patients. And the providers can you know, say, hey, I'm going to put this order in for a CBC and uh, a few other lab tests and some medications on this patient because, and explain that to the nurse. So those dialogues still need to happen in the hallways. Teaching the physicians not only how to enter orders, but how to manage orders, how to change them, how to correct them, how to um, cancel them. Those are pieces that are important. It's not just putting the order in and having everything go perfectly. Think about the areas where they may not happen to go in correctly or errors that are made commonly and have education on those pieces to the providers and staff. Uh, also training on some basic computer skills. There are some providers who really just don't feel comfortable with computers and so making sure to take them into an environment that doesn't feel like they are put um, under a microscope or um, nurses that don't feel comfortable with it, taking them aside and really saying, hey, do you feel comfortable with a computer? Do you com feel comfortable with using a mouse? Going through some basics with them so they don't have that anxiety and anticipation of this implementation um, causing them to feel even more aversion to implementing the CPOE. And moving on into another piece again is this planning process, engaging those providers and end users in the development of the process. How does the workflow happen currently? What is your ideal state and how can we make this happen electronically? Helping them to um, take, around, take out those areas of rework and wasted time and doing workflow analysis can really, really make the project go much smoother for everybody involved. It is a team project, and so again, just reiterating what was said in the previous presentation with Scott and Mary, that you need to approach this as a team and involve all those stakeholders for this process. And I'll go a little bit further into who should be included in that process on uh, the next slide. Also creating a new hire checklist for orientation. Um, we always jokingly said we want our, our nurses to use their powers for good and not evil, and so um, making sure that the nurses aren't passing on bad habits to others. Um, one habit that was being passed on that we had to take care of in one of the organizations I worked at was the barcode scanning on the bracelets. They didn't like on the night shift that when they would scan the barcode, it would beep and wake the patients up when they were getting ready to hang a new IV bag, which could normally take place without waking the patient if they didn't have the noise factor. So. They were um, printing off extra labels with an ID band on it and scanning that instead of scanning the patient's actual band. And obviously that's a workflow issue, that's a safety issue, that's just not compliant with the policy and procedure for the organization. So we had to go through and find a way to fix that issue with the beep um, happening on the night shift and so that it would scan the barcode and they would get a flash on the the wand that they use to scan the barcodes versus having that beep happen. So making sure to keep tabs on those pieces and, and making sure that they're not passed down to other staff as they move through their implementations and orientations. I think it's really important to have open communication and develop processes in a way that's conducive for all involved to do their job quickly and safely. And again, going back to engaging all staff that's necessary, this is just a starting point of a list that all other, uh, that staff should be involved in the planning process. And um, something as simple as, you know, bedside glucose uh, testing, 
they might do a quick AccuCheck on a patient that's in the emergency department and really not think outside of their department how that will impact anyone else. But what can happen is that the billing can be affected, the lab can be affected because they don't have the results that are entered in the correct place to have that information to carry on further into that patient's medical record. If they're admitted, it also can impact the inpatient setting. It can impact the emergency department if those orders and those results are not entered correctly. It can also impact the coders in the medical records department because if those are not entered in the appropriate era, era, excuse me, area, then those coders will not be able to have that information available for their coding process. And again, also with the pharmacy because many diabetic patients um, are on medications related to their diabetes and so the pharmacist having access to that information can also be extremely important. Another piece for nursing and providers is downtime procedures and pick lists. And again, this is just a reiteration of what Scott and Mary had discussed, but I do want to make sure that you realize how important this is. Having those downtime policies and procedures in place. Um, in certain facilities, they may have a red notebook that has everything they need to have for downtime procedures. It might have their paper order forms. It could have policies and procedures. It can have instructions and all the resources necessary for them to utilize during downtime procedures. And again, educating them so they know where it's at. Um, you know, staff gets very used, again, the creatures of habit, they get very used to having their processes work a certain way. And when it doesn't work that way, um, it can cause a little bit of panic and anxiety in the staff. So having that information there, training the staff on it to, to make sure that they have everything accessible and so that they can continue their work is very, very important. The other piece is creating those pick lists of favorite orders. Um, this really, really makes a huge difference for providers. Um, we've had several different hospitals that we've gone through this process with, and um, it's kind of funny. One, one hospital said that they wanted to make as few keystrokes as possible, so they numbered the providers by one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. And um, then they had to go back and revise those pick lists to go by the provider's last name because certain providers got a little upset that they were number three instead of number one. And it seems kind of silly, but those are truly barriers that do happen in certain facilities. So um, taking into consideration some of those reworks that might have to happen should you decide to, um, you know, you, they had the best interest in mind of reducing keystrokes, but then you run up against these kind of silly barriers that you never could anticipate coming. Um, also, a piece that I have found to be very, very helpful is when you do create those pick lists and those order sets, making sure to break them down into the departments such as pharmacy, lab, radiology, ancillary, as headers, and keep that same format for all orders, especially order sets, so that a provider goes into an order set knowing that first he's going to order his medications or she's going to order her labs, then radiology, then ancillary, and it also helps the nursing staff to make sure that when those orders come through that they have a logical flow that they're used to in all of those order sets. I think consistency is, is really the um, important thing to do. Moving on into access, um, really having different types of workstation on wheels or tablets or PCs or thin clients available um, Staff have different preferences, and in the facilities that I've worked in and worked with, what we did was a survey, and, and we did a, a few demos, and we let them look at different pieces of equipment and try them out. And honestly, um, what happens oftentimes is they think they're going to use a tablet when in reality they would rather take the computer on wheels or workstation on wheels into the room because it's easier for them to use. So maybe not necessarily ordering all tablets initially during the implementation and kind of ordering a few of different types of, of methods for them to use and, and play with. And then after you really find out what they're going to use, then you order more of those pieces after the process has been implemented and, and they're able to get a better idea of what works for them. Uh, there is a, a high level of frustration if they don't have access to the appropriate equipment. And so making sure that access is available and that people are not waiting in line to use the computer, uh, very, very important. Patients is probably not um, many medical staff, nursing providers' uh, virtue, so uh, myself being one, of course. Again, another piece that I would like to discuss is order sets and best practices. So considering 
um, tracking the order sets and best practices and verbal orders and telephone orders, track them pre and post implementation to see where you're at. Um, also, doing a time study is really helpful because oftentimes prov providers and nurses perceive that it takes longer to use CPOE. But if you follow the actual placement of the order through the uh, carrying out of the order, it can actually reduce a lot of time in that workflow and make things better for patients. So for example, if a provider orders um, LASIK for a patient, if they write it on paper and then take it to the desk and flip over the page and then the unit secretary or ward clerk has to um, take a look and find out, oh, it's a, it's a medication order, so then she faxes it to the pharmacy, then the pharmacy has to wait to get that order off the fax machine and so on and so forth. And what happens behind the scenes is not perceived by the providers oftentimes or the nurses oftentimes because they don't actually have to go through the rest of the workflows. But if you actually do some time studies and, sh and show that when a provider puts an order in or a nurse puts an order in for Lasix and then the patient is given the Lasix within 15 minutes versus when it was on paper and it took 35 minutes. That's really uh, speaks volumes to all your nurses and providers to get them more engaged into using CPOE. Moving on into another piece that I feel is very, very important and has been very successful in the CPOE implementations that I've worked through um, both personally with my hospitals and our clients here at the REC is creating these cheat sheets. And what it is is kind of a quick and easy reference that card that people can use for common things that people may forget to do or they don't use it very often and so they like to have that quick reference. And the way it's laid out here is um, each um, piece is a click that they will have to do. So they'll click on patient chart and then they'll click on order entry and then they'll click on the order entry tabs, then meds, select meds, process sign. So this is a process they'll have to go through for a medication order. Um, you can create these quick and easy ones. What we did in, in some of our facilities is we would make them pocket size, and so oftentimes you can find those little uh, purse size photo albums that have the laminated sheets, and you can just print off uh, a quarter sheet of a regular 8.5 by 11 piece of paper and put these in there and then slide them into the photo albums and they can carry them in their pockets, and the nurses really love that because then they can make their own individual notes and cheat sheets on uh, on those pieces and carry it with them until they felt comfortable and then they can keep them um, by the computers and workstations as well. I also think it's very important to create the full process with screenshots and be able to show the entire process so that if they really can't get what they need from the cheat sheets that they can go into the full um, detailed description of how to do these processes and have some screenshots in there so that then when the nurses are looking at the instructions and looking at their screen, they're like, yeah, I'm on the right page. Okay, this looks like the, the same thing on, as the instructions, so I know I'm doing the right thing. Super users are super important, and um, most facilities that have used super users and, and brought this into play have been very successful when they make them easily identifiable. This is actually one of my clients, um, a hospital here in Iowa, and they wore these brightly colored t-shirts during the implementation of CPOE, and they were easily, easily identifiable. When a provider or a nurse is in the hallway and they take a look and they see a yellow shirt, they know that um, they are able to call that person and say, hey, hey please help me, I, know how to, I don't know how to do this. So um, I think this is a really great idea, and whether it be the t-shirts or a vest, whatever it makes them easily identifiable to help those people get that instant assistance for their um, CPOE orders is very important. Another piece that I wanted to touch on, again, is just making it as simple and as easy as possible for the nurses and the providers, avoiding those alert fatigues and, uh, of course, without compromising patient safety, but uh, making sure that the alerts that are coming up are really relevant and important and that they don't just impede the workflow and cause a slow down in how they're ordering their uh, medications and, and different ancillary orders for their patients and nursing staff also taking that into consideration. Reducing that number of passwords and logins for those end users. So obviously single sign-on could be an extremely important piece of that as well um, if it's possible to do that or else some facilities are using the proximity badges that log them in for single sign-on. Planning and training is uh, extremely key in this process. 
so establishing training methods for the, and trainers for new employees that will be consistent again. And then planning for that staff turnover, um, especially in a smaller hospital uh, like a critical access or rural hospital, sometimes there is um, loss of knowledge because a person may quit or take a new job or go to a new department or start working in the clinic instead of the, in the hospital and they lose that knowledge base and then things fall by the wayside and the processes don't happen the way they should. So um, making sure to have that happen. Also pairing staff with a super user when they're ready to use CPOE to ensure new employees receive appropriate training and assistance to use the system correctly. And then preparing multiple people to perform the same role so there would not be a risk of losing that critical knowledge should an employee leave. Um, Another piece that's really important for nursing staff and providers is being able to discuss issues and provide feedback from these end users. Um, we used a suggestion box. We had a telephone line that they could use to call in and tell any issues they're having with CPOE. Um, also email or just uh, regular phone lines to a certain person that they could get in contact with and making sure that they had the availability to give that feedback in whatever method they chose to. Uh, communicating also consistently with the person who submitted the issue and providing them updates if the issue could not be resolved immediately. Uh, the perception of customer service can be imperative to the end user. So if they believe the issue has been submitted and not being actively investigated and worked towards a resolution, then they often stop communicating issues. So in other words, if they don't feel like anyone is, is taking a vested interest in what they've communicated to you, um, then they will c stop communicating and things um, will fall by the wayside and, and there won't be any knowledge of issues that they may be having. Um, so delegating a staff person to monitor the issues log and ensure that the issues are being addressed and resolved so that the staff does feel like their, their opinions are important. Again, back to training. Um, this process is never complete, so ensuring that there is frequent training and retraining offered. Um, somebody, I had someone say, equated to tending a garden. You will need to look for weeds and pull them and give them consistent attention consistent attention to the project over the long term. There's always going to be maintenance. So um, and also budgeting wise, ensuring that there is budget in this for the staff to receive that education as well. And really evaluating how things are going, looking at both positives and negatives to ensure that you're addressing any issues and then also highlighting successes. And celebrate. There, uh, this is a big process. This is a big change. This is a big implementation. And, and whether you are just going live or you've been live for six months or a year, celebrating those successes and encouraging those people who are using the system well. Um, nurses and providers can be competitive. So you know, just giving them a little feedback, how are you doing in comparison to other providers and staff as far as those pieces go, can be really encouraging and um, kind of instill some of that competition into all those who use the system. And most importantly, and last but not least, it's about the patient. We want the patients to receive good quality of care, safe care, and timely care. So making this process as easy as possible and keeping the patient safe, safe is very important. And um, so I always like to reiterate that as the focus on uh, use of an electronic medical record in general. And here's my contact information. If you uh, would like to contact me or have any questions, I'm happy to have you um, call or email me um, on this information here. And I will now pass the ball on so we can get a pharmacy perspective. Paul? Thank you so much, Tammy, and thank you for those real-life anecdotes. I found them, some of them quite entertaining. Uh, and Mary and Scott, thank you for the insights that you shared and the uh, strategies that you shared with us. What I want to reemphasize in this short time that we have together here, what I want to reemphasize in this time that we have remaining is that medication management and patient safety is a huge challenge for all hospitals and even more difficult in small rural hospitals due to restricted resources. I want us to remember that CPOE is a powerful tool for improving medication management and reducing medication errors, a tool with both advantages and limitations. And then I want us to explore strategies and solutions to addressing those challenges and limitations in a way that makes sense for critical access hospitals. 
Now, this quote from the IOM report back in 2006 was and is still our call to action. Because if we are serious about improving quality and patient safety in our hospitals, we must deal with the number one cause of harm, medication errors and adverse drug events. You would think that or would hope that the problem has gotten better with time, but we found in the OIG report in 2010 that we have yet to move the needle very far when it comes to preventing harm. You'll see there that uh, the most frequent problem out of that report was re related to medication errors. And so we're asking critical access hospitals to make a priority to address medication management and medication-related patient safety. Because as you can see with this chart from AHRQ, that medication-related adverse drug events are still the most frequent of the healthcare-acquired conditions. And that's especially in smaller hospitals where we may not have an OB department or a very robust surgery program or only that rare ventilator patient, even the percentage will even get higher as a percentage of total harm in our smallest hospitals. Now, one solution to reducing this harm is to utilize technology to reduce the errors. Evidence suggests that processing a prescription drug order through a CPOE system cuts the likelihood of an error on that order by almost half. Now, that's a significant reduction. And that should drive us to increase adoption of the technology, technology which could likely prevent millions of additional medication errors each year. Now, but while implementing this technology may seem like a no-brainer, we are seeing that adoption and use in U.S. hospitals remains modest. So we still have some work to do, especially in the smallest hospitals across the country. Hospitals facing low patient volume and limited financial and workforce resources. So the question is, how do we make it happen? How do we increase adoption and utilization of computerized order entry? Now, while the challenges and therefore the solutions will vary from hospital to hospital, there are proven strategies to help the process along. First of all, we need to engage leadership. Now, this is usually talking about your board, your C-suite, your medical staff. We need to develop and share a positive vision of how the technology will improve patient care with these folks. We also need to enlist champions, and you notice that's plural. Now, this is usually a clinical person, but it can be a CEO, a physician, another practitioner, a nurse, a pharmacist, but they must be a health IT champion. It can be multiple folks, but these need to be folks who get it, who understand the capabilities there, folks that must be capable of adapting methods and workflow, and that are always consistently, trustfully there. We need to communicate the advantages, and that goes beyond just telling them what it is, but also explaining the advantages and using CPOE over and again, if necessary. And we need to set realistic expectations. You see, while being realistic about the limitations of the technology, you don't want to undermine the success of your implementation by overselling the expectations. We want to define some facility-specific measures of success, and then we want to strive for those. And then most importantly, we want to show how the technology can be leveraged to access workforce that would otherwise be unavailable, adding a valuable partner to your medication management team at your facility that wasn't there before or it wasn't there in a very robust way. There are definite medication management and patient safety advantages inherent in using a computerized order entry. You know, Mary mentioned uh, some of these advantages. Legibility. There was a study of inpatient medication errors found that, that approximately 90% occurred at either the ordering or transcribing stage. Now, these errors can be due to a variety of causes, including poor handwriting, but also ambiguous abbreviations, simple lack of knowledge on the part of the ordering clinician. Now, some other advantages of CPOE include the ability to screen for potential drug-drug interactions, for drug allergies, or even lab values. An example would be warning a clinician before ordering a nephrotoxic medication in a patient that had an elevated creatinine. In addition, some systems include cl clinical decision support. 
this this type of uh, information suggests drug doses, routes of administration, or frequency. Some systems may offer more sophisticated drug safety features, preventing not only errors of commission, example, ordering a drug in an excessive dose or in a setting of a serious allergy, but also errors of omission. For an example, an alert may appear such as, you have ordered a vancomycin. Would you like to order serum vancomycin level after the third dose? Um, but even while the technology continues to improve, technology by itself is not enough. There are still limitations. In one simulated test of a computerized physician order entry system at 253 hospitals, more than a third of them missed routine medication orders, and including just over 1% missed medication errors that would have resulted in a fatality. This is because there are other factors beyond the technology which come into play. Factors such as the increasing rate of introduction of so many new pharmaceutical products, products which have increased the difficulty of pharmaceutical management of patients and has amplified the importance of expert pharmaceutical consultations, with resulting increased reliance upon pharmacists. Additionally, most electronic systems are not yet sophisticated enough to identify situations when doses of medication should be adjusted based upon the patient's renal or hepatic function or fluid status. For these reasons, pharmacist review of orders will continue to serve an important role in ensuring patient safety. And I think Tammy also mentioned that there's this thing of alert fatigue. The technology is improving and many potential medication errors such as allergic contraindications or adverse drug interactions will be automatically detected at the time of the order. But there is this phenomenon of alert fatigue occasionally causes prescribers to miss important war warnings or just not to see them or to ignore them. And a pharmacist review of the order provides a crucial stopgap in these instances. I just want to make a side note here as I've traveled this last week. And it, it occurs to me, an autopilot, especially the new generation autopilots, are capable of flying a passenger jet with great precision. But you know, I still don't want the captain and the co-pilot to come back and help serve snacks and drinks after they reach altitude. I don't. I want them in that front cockpit, and I want the experts monitoring the process. So even with CPOE, medication order review by a pharmacist remains the standard of care. And our patients don't want different standards based on the size of the facility. When I see these larger hospitals like the one Tammy referred to there, I'm, I'm jealous because there are, there are resources there and there's the ability to do things there so many times that we struggle with in small rural hospitals. But from a patient's perspective, I expect the same standard of care at that small rural hospital that I go to as if I went to one of those large hospitals. So the question is, how do we maintain that standard, especially in small rural hospitals? The solution is to find a way to engage the medication experts, the pharmacists, in the process in a way that makes sense, in spite of the challenges. And we know that due to fewer resources and lower patient volumes in these facilities, Rural hospitals face many more challenges in implementing technologies such as CPOE. And as a result, these very same clinical, financial, and demo demographic constraints may even predispose rural facilities to higher incidences of medication errors. But the challenge is not just limited to implementing the technology. Due to the same recruitment and retention issues faced by rural areas with all healthcare providers, there are also workforce issues with pharmacist oversight. And as a result, many small rural hospitals have limited hours of on-site pharmacist coverage. And the result is, not only are these hospitals finding it almost impossible to provide prospective review of medication orders before they reach the patient, only about one in five of the nation's smallest hospitals have a pharmacist review of orders within 24 hours. So. If we know that implementing CPOE technology is an evidence-based method to improve medication management and patient safety, 
But we also understand that technology in and of itself will fall short of where we need to be, in other words, the standard of care, then how do we move the needle in patient safety and medication management? Well, one solution is we marry the capability of the local health information technology with the medication expertise of the pharmacist, and we do it remotely. Now, I want you to note for just a moment, this is not a new concept. I want you critical access hospital administrators to think about teleradiology versus the circuit writing radiologist of yesteryear. It's not only a marrying of the technology to the expertise, it is actually a matter of leveraging that very technology itself to access the remotely located pharmacist, to provide enhanced medication management and patient safety for the patients of your low volume rural hospitals in a way that makes sense clinically, financially, and demographically. It's sort of a conduit, if you will, moving the resource to the need, providing better care and better outcomes at less cost. The technology makes it possible. You as leaders in your facilities must provide the leadership to actually make it happen. Now this first webinar has been an overview. It is, a, if you would, a 30,000 foot view of the entire issue. And it's pointed out the advantages and limitations of CPOE as a tool for improving medication management and reducing medication errors. It's to help us recognize the challenge for all hospitals in the area of medication management and patient safety, but especially the challenges for small rural hospitals in implementing CPOE and accessing pharmacist resources. Now during the future webinars that we're planning to uh, engage with you, we will explore different models of remote pharmacist services. We will discuss policy and regulatory issues around the, the use of remote pharmacist services. We will examine existing guidelines for Im implementing the service. And we will discuss programs and initiatives moving us toward enhanced medication management a reduction of adverse drug events, and better care, better health, and less cost to our health care system. I appreciate you being with us today. That Moving forward, we'll be leveraging health information technology, the CPOE, to access remote pharmacists and improve safe and effective medication. There's my contact information. I appreciate this time being one of you to share with you the importance of this issue and for your participation in this webinar. Thank you very much. And the HITRIC training team would like to thank Mary, Scott, Tammy, and Paul for providing their insight on this important issue. We'd also like to thank you, the learner, for viewing this recorded webinar. We look forward to your feedback and your participation in future training events.